This is Chris Eccleston, and here's a railway story with a bit of a sting in its tail. It's by Charles Dickens, and it's about an ordinary signalman. This is The Devil's Christmas. When he heard a voice thus calling to him, he was standing at the door of his box with a flag in his hand, furled round its short pole. One would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came. But, instead of looking up to where I stood on the top of the steep cutting nearly over his head, he turned himself about and looked down the line. Hello, below. From looking down the line, he turned himself about again and, raising his eyes, saw my figure high above him. Is there any path by which I can come down and speak to you? Just then, there came a vague vibration in the earth and air, quickly changing into a violent pulsation and an oncoming rush that caused me to start back as though it had force to draw me down. When such vapour as rose to my height from this rapid train had passed me and was skimming away over the landscape, I looked down again and saw him refurling the flag he had shown while the train went by. I repeated my inquiry. He motioned with his rolled up flag towards a point on my level some two or three hundred yards distant. The cutting was extremely deep and unusually precipitate. It was made through a clammy stone that became oozier and wetter as I went down. He was a dark, sallow man, with a dark beard and rather heavy eyebrows. His post was in as solitary and dismal a place as ever I saw. On either side, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, excluding all view but a strip of sky. The perspective one way, only a crooked prolongation of this great dungeon. The shorter perspective in the other direction, terminating in a gloomy red light, and the gloomier entrance to a black tunnel, in whose massive architecture there was a barbarous, depressing and forbidding air. Before he stirred, I was near enough to him to have touched him. Not even then removing his eyes from mine, he stepped back one step and lifted his hand. He directed a most curious look towards the red light near the tunnel's mouth and looked all about it, as if something were missing from it, and then looked at me. That light was part of his charge, was it not? He answered in a low voice. Don't you know it is? I detected in his eyes some latent fear of me. You look at me as if you had a dread of me. I was doubtful whether I'd seen you before. Where? He pointed to the red light he had looked at. My good fellow, what should I do there? However, be that as it may, I never was there. You may swear. I think I may. His manner cleared, like my own. He replied to my remarks with readiness and in well-chosen words. Had he much to do there? Exactness and watchfulness were what was required of him, and of actual work, manual labour, he had next to none. To change that signal, to trim those lights, and to turn this iron handle now and then, was all he had to do under that head. Was it necessary for him, when on duty, always to remain in that channel of damp air? And could he never rise into the sunshine from between those high stone walls? Why, that depended upon times and circumstances. In bright weather, he did choose occasions for getting a little above those lower shadows, but, being at all times liable to be called by his electric bell, and at such times listening for it with a redoubled anxiety, the relief was less than I would suppose. He took me into his box, where there was a fire, a desk for an official book in which he had to make certain entries, a telegraphic instrument with its dial, face and needles, and the little bell of which we had spoken. Once he had to stand without the door and display a flag as a train passed, and make some verbal communication to the driver. I should have set this man down as one of the safest of men to be employed in that capacity, but for the circumstance that while he was speaking to me, he twice broke off with a fallen colour, 
turned his face towards the little bell when it did not ring, opened the door of the hut and looked out towards the red light near the mouth of the tunnel. On both of those occasions, he came back to the fire with an inexplicable air. Said I when I rose to leave him, you almost make me think that I've met with a contented man. I, I believe I used to be so, but I'm troubled, sir. With what? Uh, it's very difficult to impart, sir. It's very, very difficult to speak of. If ever you make me another visit, I, I will try to tell you. But I expressly intend to make you another visit. Say when it shall be. I, I go off early in the morning and I shall be on again at ten tomorrow night, sir. I will come at eleven. I'll show my white light, sir, till you have found the way up. When you have found it, don't call out. And when you are at the top, don't call out. What made you cry, hello, below there, tonight? Well, no doubt because I saw you below. For no other reason? Well, what other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that those words were conveyed to you in any supernatural way? No. He wished me good night and held up his light. The distant clocks were striking eleven. He was waiting for me at the bottom of the path with his white light on. I have made up my mind, sir, that you shall not have to ask me twice what troubles me. I, I took you for someone else yesterday evening. Who? I don't know. I never saw the face. The left arm is across the face, and the right arm is waved. Violently waved. This way. I followed his action with my eyes and it was the action of an arm gesticulating with the utmost passion and vehemence. For God's sake, clear the way. One moonlight night, said the man, I was sitting here when I heard a voice cry, Hello, below there. I looked from that door and saw this someone else standing by the red light near the tunnel, waving as I just now showed you. The voice seemed hoarse with shouting and it cried, Look out, look out. And then again, hello, below there, look out. I caught up my lamp, turned it on red, and ran towards the figure calling, What's wrong? What's happened here? Where? It stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. I ran right up at it and had my hand stretched out to pull the sleeve away when it was gone. Within six hours after the appearance, the memorable accident on this line happened, and within ten hours, the dead and wounded were brought along through the tunnel over the spot where the figure had stood. A disagreeable shudder crept over me. This was just a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I had recovered from the surprise and shock, when one morning, as the day was breaking, I, standing at that door, looked towards the red light and saw the spectre again. Did it cry out? No. It was silent. Or did it wave its arm? No. It leaned against the shaft of the light with both hands before the face. That very day, as a train came out of the tunnel, I noticed a carriage window on my side. What looked like a confusion of hands and heads and something waved. I saw it just in time to signal to the driver. Stop! He shut off and put his brake on, but the train drifted past here a hundred and fifty yards or more. I ran after it and, as I went along, heard terrible screams and cries. A beautiful young lady had died suddenly in one of the compartments and was brought in here and laid down on this floor between us. I could think of nothing to say to any purpose and my mouth was very dry. The wind and the wires took up the story with a long, lamenting wail. He resumed. Now, sir, mark this and judge how my mind is troubled. The spectre came back a week ago. Ever since, it has been there, now and again by fits and starts. At the light, at the danger light. And what does it seem to do? He repeated, if possible, with increased passion and vehemence, that former gesticulation, for God's sake, clear the way. It calls to me in an agonized manner. Below there, look out, look out. It stands waving to me. It rings my little bell. I caught at that. Did it ring your bell yesterday evening when I was here and you went to the door? 
twice. And did the spectre seem to be there when you looked out? It was there. Both times? Both times. By this time, you will fully understand, sir, that what troubles me so dreadfully is the question, what does the spectre mean? I was not sure that I did fully understand. What is it warning against? What is the danger? Where is the danger? Some dreadful calamity will happen. What can I do? If I telegraph danger on either side of me, or on both, I can give no reason for it. They would think I was mad. When I saw him in this state, I saw that for the poor man's sake, as well as for the public safety, what I had to do for the time was to compose his mind. I represented to him that whoever thoroughly discharged his duty must do well, and that at least it was his comfort that he understood his duty, though he did not understand these confounding appearances. He became calm. The occupations incidental to his post as the night advanced began to make larger demands on his attention, and I left him at two in the morning. That I more than once looked back at the red light as I ascended the pathway, that I did not like the red light, and that I should have slept but poorly if my bed had been under it, I see no reason to conceal. Next evening was a lovely evening, and as I walked out early to enjoy it, the sun was not yet quite down when I traversed the field path near the top of the deep cutting. Before pursuing my stroll, I stepped to the brink and mechanically looked down from the point from which I had first seen him. I cannot describe the thrill that seized upon me when, close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw the appearance of a man with his left sleeve across his eyes, passionately waving his right arm. The nameless horror that oppressed me passed in a moment, for in a moment I saw that this appearance of a man was a man indeed, and that there was a little group of other men standing at a short distance to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he made. The danger light was not yet lighted. Against its shaft a little low hut, entirely new to me, had been made of some wooden supports and tarpaulin. It looked no bigger than a bed. With an irresistible sense that something was wrong, with a flashing, self-reproachful fear that fatal mischief had come of my leaving the man there and causing no one to be sent to overlook or correct what he did, I descended the notched path with all the speed I could make. What is the matter? I asked the man. Signalman killed this morning, sir. Not the man belonging to that box. Yes, sir. He was cut down by an engine, sir. No man in England knew his work better. But somehow he was not clear of the outer rail. It was just at broad day. He had struck the light and had the lamp in his hand. As the engine came out of the tunnel, his back was towards her and she cut him down. That man drove her and he was showing how it happened. Show the gentleman, Tom. Coming round the curve in the tunnel, sir, I saw him at the end like as if I saw him down a perspective glass. There was no time to check speed and I knew him to be very careful. As he didn't seem to take heed of the whistle, I shut it off when we were running down upon him and called to him as loud as I could call. What did you say? I said, below there, look out, look out, for God's sake clear the way. I started. Oh, it was a dreadful time, sir. I never left off calling to him. I put this arm before my eyes not to see, and I waved this arm to the last, but it was no use. Without prolonging the narrative, I may, in closing it, point out this coincidence. The warning of the engine driver included not only the words which the unfortunate signalman had repeated to me as haunting him, but also the words which I myself, not he, had attached to the gesticulation he had imitated. For God's sake, clear the way. The Devil's Christmas is produced for Radio 2 by Frank Sterling at Unique. The music is by Chris O'Shaughnessy. This is Chris Eccleston wishing you a very good night.